Nutrition and Research. As an adjunct associate professor of medicine at George Washington University and a researcher funded by the National Institutes of Health, he has led key research studies to improve the health of people with diabetes, obesity, lipid disorders, and other serious health problems. His research has been cited by the American Diabetes Association and the American Dietetic Association in official policy statements on healthful diets. Dr. Barnard completed medical school and residency at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C. in 1985, founded the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a nationwide group of physicians and lay supporters that promotes preventative medicine and addresses controversies in modern medicine. He is a New York Times best-selling author and the editor-in-chief of the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians, as well as the author of more than 20 books and counting. If you haven't already been to the bookstore to get The Cheese Trap, which is a fantastic book full of recipes, or his brand new book, Dr. Neil Bernard's Cookbook for Reversing Diabetes, I highly recommend it. Now, as one of his over 200 Food for Life instructors, it is my great honor to introduce to you tonight Dr. Neil Barnard. Hi, thank you, everybody. Thanks for spending your Friday evening with me. Um, Sandy asked me to remind everybody that the clocks do change tonight, right? Do they go backward? Forward. They go forward? We lose an hour? Yep. Do we ever get it back? No. I don't know. All right, let's talk about cheese. Uh, University of Michigan, 2015, researchers did a survey. They brought in 384 people and they asked them, which foods give you problems? And when they meant problems, they meant, they meant which foods do you just love too much and you just can't stop? You can't cut down, you can't quit eating them, you just lose control over how much you eat. And what do you think? Number five was ice cream. No big surprise, right? Number four was cookies. Number three was chips. Number two was chocolates. And the number one problem food turned out to be pizza. And I'm gonna guess it's not the sun-dried tomatoes. It's not the olives. It's not even the crust. It's something about that quarter inch of yellow asphalt dribbling down your fingers and into your lap and falling into your coronary arteries that really people just love. And the problem is we may love cheese. It just doesn't love you back is the big problem. So what is cheese anyway? Let's go to Wisconsin. We're going to go to Whitmer's Cheese Factory in Therese, Wisconsin, outside of Milwaukee. And early in the morning, they bring the milk in and they put it in this thing that looks like a wading pool. And they pour it in. And now, if we're going to turn milk into cheese, what do we do? We need bacterial cultures, right? What kind of bacteria do you use? Not just any bacteria. What would you use? Well, between your toes, there are certain bacteria called Brevi bacteria, B-R-E-V-I, Brevi bacteria. And if you had a college roommate who didn't do laundry for an extra special long time, that smell that's pervading your entire room is the smell of Brevi bacteria fermenting skin oils and things like that. So if you want to make a really good stinking monster, are you going to use something like Brevi bacteria? No, you're going to use the real article. They don't use something like it. That's exactly what they put into the cheese in Widmer, Widmer's factory. So in it goes. And as time goes on, it's creating this funky fermentation smell. And now we need to solidify it, so we'll use rennet. Anybody know what rennet is? Rennet? What is it? Where does it come from? Okay, it's an enzyme. It comes from the fourth stomach of a slaughtered calf, and it will coagulate the milk into solid. Now, a lot of dairies, most dairies, no longer use calf rennet. They use a genetically engineered rennet. But here at Widmer's, they use the real thing. Um, and then we're going to let the whey drain off. The whey is the watery part that has the milk sugars in it. And that drains away. And now I'm left with solid cheese. But to stop those bacteria from going too far, I need to salt it down. So that's what we do. We're going to add some salt. And that's cheese. That's how we do it. So what have I done? I took milk. 
But I concentrated it so as to increase the calories, increase the protein, increase the cholesterol, increase the fat, and increase the sodium or salt. Well, could this lead to weight issues? Well, let's tackle that. A lot of folks, if you ask them, why are kids heavy these days? Why do we have childhood obesity? This is what they're going to say, right? Soda. Kids are having too much soda. However, I'm going to put a question mark on that because if you look at sweeteners, this is sugar, all, all kinds of sugar, including high fructose corn syrup, table sugar, all of them. It went, you see this? It went up, 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 up until 1999. And that was the year that bottled water was so popular that it started to really edge colas and other sodas off the shelf. And ever since then, sodas have been falling and sugar in general has been falling. However, cheese is on a different trajectory. It's going up, 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 up. As of 20, 2018, the average American consumes 35 pounds of cheese per person per year, which turns out to be 65,000 calories of cheese every single year. I'm talking about one person, and I'm not eating any, so somebody's getting 130,000 calories of cheese every year. All right, so where are the calories? Do you remember this? A gram of sugar has only four calories, a gram of fat has nine calories. So if I take some, say, the leanest beef, it's not really so lean, it's 29% fat, and every fat gram has how many calories? Nine. So if I switch to chicken, it's not much lower. 23. Fish, berry, some lower, some higher. But broccoli is pretty low in fat. And beans are even lower. And rice and sweet potatoes are really low. So, where's cheese? Is cheese like beef? Or is it sort of like rice? You think it's high? More like beef? Typical cheeses are 70% fat. Mostly saturated fat. That's the bad fat. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. And people are eating huge amounts of this stuff every year. Okay. And by the way, you can get sweet things that don't have any sugar in them at all. You can get Coke Zero, right? But there is no Cheddar Zero. Sorry. It doesn't exist. It's all got calories. So, the other thing is beans have fiber in them. We talked about this for you, those of you who were in my session this morning. Beans have fiber and broccoli has fiber. And foods that have fiber, the fiber fills you up. But because fiber doesn't have any meaningful calories, you push away from the table. So there's about five grams of fiber in a serving of baked beans and another five in a cup of broccoli. And an apple has four grams and an orange has three grams and a banana has three and brown rice has four. And where's cheese on here? Well. Cheese is not a plant, so it doesn't have fiber. Doesn't have any fiber whatsoever. A lot of calories, no fiber. Okay. And the other thing is, did you know that you know sodium? What bad health effect can come from sodium? Okay, raise your blood pressure, right? Okay, but it does something else. It can cause you to gain a little bit of weight because sodium causes you to hold water, not a huge amount, but maybe two or three extra pounds is just plain water weight that comes from sodium. So an orange has a milligram of sodium, and an apple has two, and brown rice has 20, and a potato has 13, and potato chips in a two-ounce serving has 330. So where's cheese? Is it more like an apple, more like potato chips? What would you say? More like the chips? OK, cheddar cheese, 350. If it's Edom, 500. And our pal Velveeta weighs in at 800 milligrams of sodium in a two-ounce serving. Am I cheering you up? OK, so it's got so much fat, you wouldn't believe it. It doesn't have any fiber at all. It's one of the highest sodium foods that there is. OK, all right. So we talked about this, for those of you who were in my session this morning, but I just want to come back here real quick. Um, how many of you were in my session this morning? All right, so just real quick. Um, I showed a slide of Seventh-day Adventists and showed that these are non-smoking, health-conscious people, and those who are meat eaters are the heaviest, and those who are vegans are the skinniest. This is BMI, and a healthy BMI is below 25. All right, now, as I mentioned this morning, if you look at ovo-lacto-vegetarians, they're the second skinniest group, but the vegans are much healthier. 
That's a, that's a much healthier body weight. So let's zero in on those two. I am going to argue that the principal difference between an ovo-lacto-vegetarian diet and a vegan diet is cheese. That's the thing, okay? All right, so if you did the math, that's good for between 13, 14, maybe 15 pounds of extra weight that you can get rid of by breaking that cheese addiction. Okay, all right. So can you get hooked on this stuff? Yeah. Did you ever know anybody who said, I can be vegan? Except for cheese. Yeah, a lot of people feel that way. And in our research studies, we put people on vegan diets for diabetes or high cholesterol or weight problems, and they get better fast. But a surprising number of them say, my craving is cheese. Not ice cream, not milk, not steak. It's specifically cheese that lures them back. So why would that be? Well, part of it could be salt. Remember earlier I was saying you add salt to stop the bacteria from going too far. And they use a lot of salt. Um, we like salty, fatty things, and cheese is fatty, so like onion rings or french fries, if it's salty and greasy at the same time, we get hooked on it. But there's something else, casomorphins. Casein is the dairy protein. And if you could look at it under a powerful microscope, it's a chain, it's like, like a necklace of one bead connected to another, and another, and another, and another. All proteins are like that. And in your digestive tract, as it breaks apart, it releases what are called casein-derived morphine-like compounds. They are narcotics. And here's the chemical structure of them. And this one, morphoseptin, is like that. And that one has about one-tenth of the brain-binding power compared with pharmacy-grade pure morphine. So it's, it's not strong enough to get you arrested, but it is just strong enough to make you say, cheese, I can be vegan except for cheese. And, and one other thing, if any of you ever happen to have surgery, and after your procedure they put you on a narcotic painkiller like Demerol or something like that, and did it have an effect on your digestive tract? Did it block you up, make you constipated for a while? Okay, did you ever linger at the cheese bar a little too long? and notice that it kind of bound you up in the same way. Cheese can be very constipating. And that's because as it breaks apart, it releases narcotics directly into the intestinal tract. It hits the intestinal wall and will block you right up, just like any other narcotic. Because it's not like a narcotic, it is a narcotic. Okay? Um, so the cheese industry is well aware of this. And so is our government. And I'd like to share with you some slides that I got from the US government through the Freedom of Information Act. These are not my slides. Um, in the year 2000, the US government worked with Dairy Management Inc. to put on a program that was responsive to an American law that says the US government has to promote American agricultural products. And they thought, cheese, okay. So we need to trigger cheese craving. And the way they did it, is they separated Americans into two groups. One group they called the enhancers. These are people who just sprinkle a little cheese on their salad. We're not interested in your people. The cheese cravers, that's the group we want to isolate because they will open up the refrigerator, crack off some cheese and stuff it in their mouth and they will double or triple or quadruple their cheese intake if you push them. How do we do that? Well, we want to trigger cheese craving. And the government realized you can't just put ads on TV saying, geez, maybe you should have some of it. Uh -uh. They signed a contract, which I can show you, with Wendy's. They said, Wendy's, you're in just about every town in America. Why don't you accept our check and market something called the Wendy's Cheddar Lovers Bacon Cheeseburger? And Wendy's signed the contract and did so. And it sold two and a quarter million pounds of cheese. But don't get paranoid, this is the way the government works. Um, they then worked with Subway to make sure that every single sandwich has cheese on it. And they worked with Pizza Hut to put an entire pound of cheese on one serving. They worked with Burger King and Taco Bell so that when you're driving through the Taco Bell drive-thru, they would say, hi, welcome to Taco Bell. Would you like to try a quesadilla today? 
This was all done on contract with the U.S. government, specifically designed to trigger cheese craving so that you would eat more of it. And you might be saying, wait a minute, the same government that is worried about childhood obesity and puts up dietary guidelines about not having too much fat in your diet and trying to cut down on salt is actively paying fast food chains to push more cheese in front of us? Yes. And they are not done. This is continuing now, okay? Now they are more than happy to say, our kids are heavy because they're having too much soda. That's it, it's the soda. They are actively promoting these products. And cheese shows no sign of stopping. All right, so there it is. Um, as, as of 2018, we're up to 35 pounds of cheese per person per year. Could this affect my health? Could it? Could cheese affect my health? Um, let me show you, this is Catherine Lawrence. Catherine was from Louisiana. And she was an aerospace engineer working for the Air Force, and she was one of the first people to go in Iraq in 2003 because it was her job to design military bases and construct the bases. And she went over there, and when you're working in a war zone and you eat what the government gives you, and you work really hard, you don't gain any weight. But eventually your tour of duty starts to wind down and you make plans to go home, when she got off the plane back in Louisiana, her friend said, Catherine, welcome home. What did you miss while you were in Iraq? She said, I'll tell you. I miss cheese. I miss cheese, macaroni and cheese. I miss cheese snacks. I'd really love to have some cheese. So a friend of hers, for her birthday, gave her an entire case of macaroni and cheese dinners, 48 boxes, which she ate for 48 days in a row. She loved it. But it didn't love her back. She started to gain weight, and she started to develop some pain in her abdomen. Her belly started to hurt, and it started to wax and wane with her monthly cycle. It would be really excruciating, then a little bit better, and then the next month it would be excruciating, and it got worse and worse and worse. She went to see her doctor, and the doctor did a laparoscopy. Do you know what this is? You put a little incision in the abdomen, and you have a little scope. You can look inside the belly. And the doctor looked around, sewed her up, sent her to the recovery room, and said, we got, it. we got the diagnosis. It's called endometriosis. Cells that line the uterus have come out, and they're planting all around your abdomen. This is fueled by hormones. And she said, OK, what do I do? And they tried various painkillers and various medical treatments. But as the months went by, she was getting worse and worse and worse. And there were days every month she couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't function, and this had no, there was no sign of getting better. So the doctor said, I got another treatment for you. Um, how about a hysterectomy? She said, well, we were thinking about having a family. Well, maybe that's just not in the cards for you. OK. So she scheduled the hysterectomy. But before that day came, a friend of hers said, you know, some people change their diets to get their hormones in better balance. Breast cancer patients have been doing this for a long time. You go to a more plant-based diet and estrogen activity settles down. And you do that to take the heat off the, the growth of cancer. And so a friend said, why don't you see a nutritional counselor and see if he gets somewhere with it? So her counselor said, no animal products for you. No dairy, no cheese, no meat, nothing vegan. Keep the oils really low. and." This is my prescription. <coughs> Almost immediately, she started to feel better. Her energy was better, she started losing weight, but her pain was better. It was going down and down and down, and when her period came, it just wasn't as bad. And a couple months went by, and she was feeling really quite well. The doctor said, let's do a follow-up, and brought her in, did another laparoscopy. Opened her up, looked inside, looked all around, sewed her up, and sent her into recovery. And the doctor walked out to the waiting room where her husband was waiting, and her doctor said, this is really something. Her endometriosis is essentially gone. And her husband said, you know, she went vegan a while ago, and she has been feeling better day by day by day. The doctor said, no, 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 no. Foods don't cause endometriosis. And there's no way a diet could make it go away. There's only one explanation for this. This is a miracle. 
So I think Miracle is written in her medical chart somewhere, that she had a miracle. Well, anyway, she lost a lot of weight. Um, she never had the procedure, she never had the surgery. She's still got her uterus and she also has three kids. Um, and so she joined the Physicians Committee. She's now one of our Food for Life instructors, um, working in Dallas, um, teaching other women how to take control of their health. Food isn't perfect, but it beats the heck out of having to find out the operating room. When you need Um, okay, so we just talked about a hormone condition that got better with a diet change. Now, wait, 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 wait. Hormoned milk. Hmm. A cow does not give milk until the cow has been pregnant and has given birth, right? And this is kind of like biology 101. You know, you can't just bring in a cow and get milk out of the cow. The cow has to be pregnant, the cow has to give birth, and now the cow is making milk that we can take. Pregnant cows they have a gestation of about nine months, the, similar in length to a human pregnancy. And when they are pregnant, they are making sex hormones, and the sex hormones go into their blood plasma. And some of it goes into the milk, and especially toward the end of their pregnancy, there's a substantial amount. And you could take a pail of milk from a cow, and you could send it to a university laboratory, and they can tell you how far along in pregnancy that cow is. There is it's, it's not a lot of estrogen. But it's enough. To, you can detect it. You can see it's there. And see, yes, this cow is pregnant. Here's how far she is. So, could these traces of estrogens in a cow's milk affect our health? Well, researchers uh, at Harvard studied men in fertility clinics. And they looked at men who were big cheese consumers, that's the red line, and the men who didn't consume so much cheese. And what they found is that if a man consumes a lot of cheese, his sperm count goes down. And his sperm morphology, the shape and motility, their movement, is abnormal. And what they are hypothesizing is that even though it's just a trace of hormones, female hormones, it could be enough to affect a man's fertility. Okay, well, that's not super worrisome compared to Researchers in California looked at women who had had breast cancer. They were all treated for it. And their question is, will my cancer ever come back? Am I going to survive this? And it turned out in this study that those women who consumed the most high-fat dairy, I'm talking about cheese, I'm talking about butter, they had a 49% higher risk of dying of their cancer compared to the women who consumed the least. Now here's, I'm going to dig in here a little bit more. These women consumed a high amount of high-fat dairy, a high amount was defined as more than one serving a day. Not really a huge amount. A low amount was, was less than half a serving per day. But what they decided is the same thing as the, the researchers in the fertility clinic. They said, there's only a trace of female sex hormones in the milk. Could that really affect a woman's biology? Well, think about this. There's traces in milk, but when you turn milk into cheese, the hormones go with the fat, and you consume 35 pounds of it last year, this year, next year, and you already have all the hormones in your body you're supposed to have. So could dripping that faucet of a little bit more hormones and day by day by day by day affect your, your, your biology? I don't know. But scientists are worried about it. And it raises the question, if you have a six-year-old son, how much of this do you want him to have? If you've got a seven-year-old daughter and you are thinking about what she might eat for lunch, how much hormones do you want to be sprinkling in her food? What about asthma? Uh, this is Chad. Chad grew up in New Hampshire, right on the water. And Chad and his brother were really sporting types. They loved baseball and football. Except that Chad couldn't get through a game because Chad had asthma. And in the course of exercising, his exercise-induced asthma would kick in. Or if he would go visit a friend's um, house and they had a dog, that would trigger his asthma and he'd end up in the emergency room. Or if it was the fall and seasonal allergies would kick in, then he, his asthma was terrible. When he was about 18 years old, a friend said, Chad, come on, don't you know about getting away from dairy? Dairy causes lots of respiratory problems for kids with 
um, chronic bronchitis, or, or little kids who have ear problems, uh, or people with sinus issues, getting away from dairy doesn't solve all of their problems, but it solves a lot of them. So his, his friend said, do you want to try going vegan? What do I got to lose? He went vegan at around eight, eight, maybe 18 uh, years of age, and within about four months his asthma was totally gone. He was off all of his medications, and not only was his asthma gone, but his pet allergies were gone, and his seasonal allergies were gone too. Now, I, let me tell you something. I don't know why this is, but for some reason, when people get away from dairy products, in many cases, other allergies get better. Um, you might get really allergic to, to a cat or a dog, and when you get away from dairy, these other allergies just sell down. And I don't know why that is. It's something about a priming of the immune system's reactivity that goes away when you stop dairy. Don't take any of this on faith. If, you, if you're interested in trying it, just try it out. Or if you have a loved one who's got inhalers and allergies and so forth, get them away from dairy for two, three months and just see if they don't get better. Okay? And if you want, you can challenge yourself by bringing the dairy back. And pretty soon you'll see if it works for you or not. Okay, so Chad did this. Daz was totally gone, feeling great. And he joined, do you know Ruby, uh, the online cooking school? He started to work for Ruby making an entirely vegan online cooking course so that other people could tackle their asthma too. So, asthma, could that really be caused by dairy? Well, I don't know, that's a controversial subject, so let's Google it, okay? Asthma, dairy, let's see what we come up with. Okay, the National Asthma Council Australia has got it. Uh, it's right there on their homepage. Dairy foods have often been suggested as a common trigger for asthma. Hmm. But there's little scientific evidence to support this myth. Unfortunately, most Australians are missing out on the health benefits that come from consuming milk, cheese, and yogurt, as they don't include enough dairy foods in their diet. It's starting to smell a little funny, isn't it? Let's go back. Let's look at their, whole, let's look at their sponsor page. Okay, let's see. There's the dairy industry. They make money if you consume dairy. And there's one, two, three, four, five drug companies that make money if you've got asthma. None of them make any money if you cure yourself. And I'm sorry to tell you that industries have recognized that they need health advocates. The American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics all take money from food manufacturers. The American Heart Association set up something called the Industry Nutrition Advisory Panel. If you're McDonald's, if you're the Beef Chekhov, if you're Coca-Cola, you can and do pay $10,000 a year per company to the American Heart Association. They'll take your check. And in return, they will allow you to have private meetings with their officials who may accept their nutrition policy. Do you think the American Heart Association is ever going to come out against any food that is paying them 10 grand a year? Is there a reason that they don't say, stop eating meat, don't eat bacon and salt, these things are bad, do, do you think that's ever going to happen? And this corrupting influence in medicine is, I'm sorry to tell you, pervasive. And the doctor who treats them, who, who will treat you, in many cases they get paid by how many times you come in and how many procedures they have to do, and if you are healthy, they're not making money. We need to change this system. Every other country has figured this out. Eventually we have to as well. For now, we're on our own and we have to be educated. <laughs> we need our doctors to be a little bit unemployed. Wouldn't it be nice if they had Wednesday afternoons off instead of making so much money? Okay. Um, in every book that I've written, I, they're always focused on health and biology. But this one, I, if it's all right, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about them. Because when I was writing The Cheese Trap, I was really struck by some things that went on in the dairy industry that I didn't know about in detail. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share this with you. Um, because it might help you stay on the straight and narrow just a little bit. Um, I mentioned that to make milk, a cow has to be impregnated. Um, and, and this is not done with roses and chocolates out in the field. <laughs> let, me, let me introduce you. No, that doesn't happen. The farmer uh, has the cow impregnated every single year. Um, 
the, the farmer doesn't do this personally, but the farmer has farm hands that do this. And to show you how it works, um, let me show you some slides that came from the United Nations. The United Nations helps farmers around the world with low literacy illustrations on how to conduct procedures like artificial insemination of your cows. And these, this is a UN diagram. Here's what you do. You take your left hand and you put a glove that goes all the way up to your shoulder and you insert your left hand into the cow's rectum and it goes up to about your elbow and at that point you can feel the uterus through the rectal wall. And if you hold the, the uterus really still with your left hand, with your right hand you take what looks like a knitting needle and you shove it through the cervix and you then inject semen that you had just extracted from a bowl. Now, these animals are not volunteers. <laughs> However, she is not going to object because she's chained by the neck and she cannot turn around or do any, much of anything at all. She's going to be impregnated by you on that day whether she wants to be or not. And this is the way it looks at, in uh, Wisconsin. And then you write the date on her flank because nine months later she's going to give birth. And her calf is born. She didn't want to be pregnant, but she is. And now, this is her baby. And there's nothing cuter than a newborn calf. And the little calf looks up at mom, and they've got these huge eyes, and the, the, the baby blinks up at mother. And she looks down at her calf, and you can see this mother-infant bond starting to form, and she licks him clean. And the, the farmhands all gather around, because it's really a very nice thing. Except, this is a dairy farm, and if she nurses her baby, what are we going to sell? So the farmers have an implement that works really well in this situation. It's called a wheelbarrow. You pick up the calf by the chest and stick the calf into the wheelbarrow and wheel the calf away. Now there is no bond stronger than a mom and her baby. It does not matter what species you are. And she is not going to have you take her baby away and she will follow you and she'll push and she'll basically say that's my baby you're taking away and sooner or later a gate will slam in her face and she will stand right there and cry out and her calf is going to end up over there in a uh, in a little hutch where the calf will be fed milk replacer instead of mom's milk and if that's a male calf very soon he's going to be slaughtered he's going to be veal we can't use you around here so let's just slaughter you for for veal if she's a female, her horns will be cut off because we're going to raise her to be a dairy cow. And if you get her early enough, they do a process called disbudding, where you just scrape the horns right out of the skull. This happens to every cow every single year. That's how you maximize milk production. You impregnate them, nine months later they give birth. You impregnate them, they give birth. You impregnate them, they give birth. And you, every single time, you take away her baby. Now, I saw this in a Massachusetts newspaper as I was writing the cheese trap. Strange noises from the high road near Sunshine Dairy Farm Monday night and into yesterday morning prompted local police to alert residents that there's nothing spooky or scary going on. According to Newberry Police Sergeant Patty Fisher, the noises are coming from mother cows who are lamenting the separation from their calves. It happens every year at the same time. Now, I have to tell you, it doesn't matter if it's a big farm or a little farm. Every single dairy cow is artificially inseminated. They always lose their calf and they cry all night long. This is, this is the only way you get milk, the only way you get yogurt, the only way you get ice cream, and the only way you get cheese. And you can go to India and people will swear to you how much they love their water buffaloes that are giving them, them milk. They will look you in the eye and tell, them, tell you how much they respect life. What they won't tell you is how they worked around things so that those animals will all end up dead. It's the biggest meat-producing country in the world. People who aren't eating it. Spent dairy cows. Here's what happens. 200,000 dairy cows. By the time they hit four years, four years of age, the farmer says, you're not really worth it to me anymore. I've got to give you so much feed grain to get so much milk out of you, you're not producing like you used to, 
you're going to slaughter your daughter, taking your place. We're going to artificially inseminate her, take away her kids. She's going to do better than you. Every dairy farm works exactly that way. The lifespan of a cow is about 20 years. In America, it's four. They all become leather and meat. Am I cheering you up? It's kind of creepy, isn't it? Is there something I can eat instead? Is there? Is there something I can eat instead of this? Let's say I don't want to be part of this anymore. Um, of course there is. Instead of feta on my salad, I can put some avocado on my salad. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, we knew about grilled cheese, and it was only maybe 20 years later that somebody said, why don't you try a hummus sandwich? We thought, hummus, humus, what is that made from? Oh, that makes a pretty good sandwich, let's try that. Um, you can go to the store and find one of these pizzas, but right next to it is that one. And they taste good. They work fine. Or you can make your own pizza. I know, anybody ever make a vegan pizza? Sure, it works fine. Your secret ingredient will be nutritional yeast. It has that smell of cheese, but it doesn't have any fat in it at all. Perfectly great. Anybody ever make a tofu ricotta? You know your friend swore it was the real thing. <laughs> it tastes just like ricotta cheese. It works fine. You can make a bang up great lasagna or whatever with no regrets. And of course there are vegan cheeses now made of cashews, or some of them made, kite heel is made from almond milk, where they use the same cultures, exactly the same system, but they start with almond milk instead of cow's milk. And that's cool, because you don't have to impregnate an almond. It doesn't have any hormones, okay? So there's lots of choices for you. Um, and this book, Cheese Trap, uh, came out last year, and I want to sing some praises for Drina Burton, my uh, co-author, who did the recipes for it. So, uh, some of you may know Drina. She's really great and does wonderful recipes, and I asked her to simulate cheesecake and all kinds of things. Um, and so that's it. I hope you have fun with the cheese trap. And by the way, this book just came out yesterday. Drina and I did this new book for reversing diabetes, and she did all the recipes, so I'm going to brag about her. They've got it in the bookshop. Please buy 25 of them for all your closest friends. Um, if any of you is new to this, and you're thinking, I'd like to go vegan, my main tip is focus on the short term. Don't plan on what you're going to eat in 2025, because that makes you unsure if you really want to do it 100%. If you focus on the short term, I'm going to do it for the cruise, I'm going to do it for three weeks, whatever, you'll do it 100%. percent you say, I'm going to really do it. And then pretty soon it just becomes automatic. So to help you, we have our 21-day vegan kickstart at pcrm.org. And you get daily emails and menus and recipes, and it's in several different languages. And I hope you give it a, have a chance to give it a try. Um, I mentioned this this morning, but I'll mention it again for any health professionals. Please join us in Washington. Um, August 10th and 11th, we've got a great CME conference. And the last thing that I just want to say is, wouldn't it be an annoying thing if you had to do one diet to be ethical, and a different diet to be an environmental steward, and something else to be good for your coronary arteries, and something else to reduce your cancer risk? But the neat thing is, getting the animals off your plate helps all of those things. So once a person is following a healthy plant-based diet, it's true, there's all kinds of animals waving white handkerchiefs at you saying, thank you, you're a wonderful person. And the earth is breathing easier, and if you listen, your coronary arteries are thanking you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.